an article jumped out, and I wanted to do a little bit of research. Uh, and this is the, C the CEO of Citibank, right? The CEO of Citibank, her name is Jane Frazier. She was named CEO of Citibank back in 2020. 2020, a woman was named CEO of Citibank. Fast forward to 2023, and Citibank is officially in trouble. Officially in trouble, so much so to where it's speculated that Citibank has went on a journey to practically close all of their branches. Went on a journey to practically close all of their branches. Thank you, Will Finesse. I'm going to be reading Super Chat shortly. Uh, and I want to make sure that I leave y'all with some insight and information so that y'all can go ahead and take this money with y'all. Uh, make sure y'all tap into the Patreon link is in the description as well as pinned to the top of the chat. Citigroup is in trouble. After the company's collapse during the 2008 recession, Citi stock has continuously struggled. Shares of the company saw more than a 30% drop over the last five years. The firm has faced many ups and downs over the course of my career here. And it's clear we have challenges that we need to urgently address right now. Citigroup has had worst in class efficiency returns and stock market valuation. And that's so Citigroup is basically being ran into the ground. Citigroup is officially being ran into the ground and it's reflected in the stock price and their market value. Let's continue. It's led to underperformance over almost any time frame. They haven't been profitable enough. It's a chronic laggard in profitability. It's not that it's teetering on the edge. Once the largest bank in America, Citigroup is now the third biggest in the US with over $1.7 trillion in consolidated assets. Globally, it is the 11th largest with just over $2.4 trillion in total assets. Citigroup, I believe, is finally turning a page. The first step to improve is to recognize that you have a problem in the first place. We know there is a clear cut case. This is the CEO of Citigroup, okay? Citibank, Citigroup, this is a CEO. Her name is Jane Frazier. She was anointed to be CEO in 2020. And now in 2023, everything is falling to fucking part. But then they give them credit and they say, well, when you recognize that you got a problem and you start to put a plan in place in order to solve for that problem, then ultimately we're going to extend your contract and we're going to make sure that we continue to pay you uh, so that you can make changes. Do you guys know how banks make money? Largely banks make money. So when they showed you that list of the largest banks in the U.S. and the largest banks worldwide, right, what they were basically showing you was the assets under management, right? Assets under management largely is the amount that you, that you have on your books. Those assets can be written down. They can increase exponentially over time. And largely banks make money by allowing for themselves to continue to lend out money based off of their deposits, right? So they can exponentially lend out uh, more money depending on what their deposits are or depending on what their asset and their balance sheet looks like. They can lend out money hoping that you qualify in order for them to be able to make money off of your money. So, for example, if they lend you out a mortgage, I once had a mortgage with Citigroup. Actually, I had a mortgage that, that, that I took over that was with Citigroup and then it got sold off to a different bank. Completely different conversation. But I once had a mortgage off of Citigroup. And when I opened up my... Um, when I opened up my statement and I looked at it, and this was very early, this was a long time ago, that I, one of my first mortgages that I carried. And when I looked at it, it said that this is how much that was going to principal and this is how much it was going to interest. And so it's in the bank's best interest to keep good paying people such as you on the books in order for them to continue to make money. They make money off fees. They make money off of the interest on the loans. They also make money off of servicing, right? That's the third category that a lot of people don't tell you servicing is the amount of money that they make based off of the platform that they've created in order to be able to service your loan. So for example, let's say that I'm a big bank and I've created a platform in order for people to be able to pay their mortgage and that you're a smaller entity, but you still want to be in the game. You want to get the interest payments. You want to make money off the fees and so on and so forth. Well, depending on how many loans that I carry of yours, I can then service those loans. And depending on the state of those loans, such as when your loans was in forbearance during the pandemic, I can raise up the prices of how much I'm servicing per loan per month, or I can lower the prices based off of how much I'm serving those loans per month per month. So for example, when loans were in forbearance, 
the servicers of the loans, and a lot of times you don't see it as a consumer because all you do is log in and pay your bills, but ultimately the servicers of the loans are the ones that's making money without even carrying the loans. So banks make money in a in a bevy of different ways, most people don't understand it, and that's why they're incentivized to continue to lend to you, and they want people that are willing to pay and carry a good credit rating because they have a greater chance of being able to collect that money and continue to keep you in their pocket for the next 30 to 40 years or for the rest of your life. And so when we talk about debt, we don't really understand how money works, and so we're not able to leverage it correctly because we think that good credit means that you can buy more shit, and that actually substantiates that you're a better person. It doesn't. So when we're taking that into consideration, when we're looking at this video and we're understanding how she's possibly running this company into the ground, consider all of the information that I gave you as far as how banks make money. Let's continue. It's for change at City. I hope you've seen we're acting on it, positioning our firm's long term future and tackling the issues that have held us back head on. The challenge now will be executing and changing that culture to what she wants to be more real time and more aware and more intense and more about winning. So what kind of changes is City making and can it return to its former glory? In April 2021, Jane Frazier, the CEO of Citigroup, announced a bold shift in the company's strategy, exiting 13 retail markets outside of the United States. Asia and the EMEA region accounted for more than a third of Citi's net revenue in the year prior. This global vision that Citi Retail Banking was an aspirational bank, that it was kind of like the Nike swoosh or the Mercedes star, that it was a branded global good. And every CEO had that vision. And, you know, maybe in the 60s it was true. Under Jane Frazier, Citi is finally unwinding the failed 50-year experiment of serving consumers all around the world. The old so essentially what they're doing is similar to the same thing that a lot of these auto companies is doing, and they're exiting markets that they don't think is profitable, even though they believe that it's a growth strategy for you to be there, right? Often at times, analysts reward companies that are focused on top-line growth instead of companies that are incredibly profitable. I'll give you an example of some that are successful. Tesla, earlier in their journey, was not profitable, but analysts was looking at their growth in order to reward them to continue to embrace the possibility of them being one of the top companies in the world. And they were right, right? Because Tesla was more than just an auto manufacturer. They were a technology company. And so analysts a lot of times look for growth. They don't always look for whether or not you're profitable. Conversely, you'll take a company like a Toyota or a General Motors or a Ford Motor Company, which was incredibly profitable during a time where Tesla was losing money, but Tesla's stock was going up significantly. So a lot of these banks and different companies were incentivized to go and seek out new markets all across the world because it would then reflect in their stock price because they had a bigger bevy of people in order for them to be able to push their products to so that they can grow the company and then re be rewarded by analysts and stockholders, right? Well, that didn't work. It was a 50-year experiment in which they went over into different markets and they were trying to grow it, grow the company. But the reality was that they were losing money every single year. And so as a result, the business that you had in one area was paying for the losses over in another area, hoping that it manifests into something that was great. And it did not go well. It did not go well. So when you analyze in these companies, pay attention to the growth strategy and whether or not they're profitable and what the long-term profitability or the long-term vision for the CEO is of that company. All right. Old banking adage has played out. Wholesale banking is global. Retail banking is local. In 2022 alone, Citigroup completed sales of its business in five countries and added Mexico to the list of countries it's departing. What's been obvious to analysts for a long time is that you know, Citi had become too unwieldy, too big to manage, and that ultimately a lot of the disparate parts overseas, they didn't really have very many synergies between them. Four executives I spoke to actually referred to these businesses as melting ice cubes. In other words, that over time, with disinvestment, with perhaps not the greatest management focus from HQ, that ultimately their value was decreasing versus some of the sharper, more motivated, locally owned competitors in many of these overseas markets. City. When you hear a company or when you hear analysts often say things like synergy, let me tell you what they mean. Synergy is translation for how can we execute the vision for this over here while using the same amount of resources. So I'll give you an example. Often at times when companies merge or when another company gets bought out, 
they say that we're looking to figure out how it is that we can create synergies between both companies, meaning that they want the same customer base, but they're trying to figure out how it is that they can execute with less resources. So if this particular you know, company has a platform and this particular company has a platform, why do we need two different development teams, right? Why do we need two different HRs? Why do we need two different platforms or cloud infrastructure strategy or this or that, so on and so forth? How can we use the same user base to create one different plat one platform in which we can serve all of the customers and absorb all of the money as a result of it? I'll give you an example of that, right? Often at times, and I like to use automakers because I know a lot about automakers. Historically, automakers would buy a company right? Let's say, for example, Ford Motor Company at one point bought the Premier Automotive Group, which included Volvo, Land Rover, and something else. I forgot what the other one was. Jaguar. Volvo, Land Rover, Land Rover and Jaguar, right? So Volvo, Land Rover, and, ja and Jaguar all existed under this brand called the Premier Automotive Group. In order to create synergy amongst the companies, what they would do is they would create one platform. So one basic platform in which they can change the look and the feel, but the engine was the same, right? The the wheelbase was the same, right? They use the same engineering teams. And so what they was trying to do was rebrand the different vehicles. So you may create a, a, a platform in which you can have the F-150, the Expedition, and then maybe they can extend over into the Land Rover or they can use it in order to create synergy. So basically they're saving costs but still making the same amount of money by selling it to different customers by branding different. Well, it didn't work. And so eventually when Ford Motor Company started to go under, um, at the same time that General Motors and Chrysler filed for bankruptcy during the 2008 crisis, they had to raise money. Uh, and then they sold parts off from the premier automotive group. General Motors did some of the same things as far as making sure that they got rid of Saab. Uh, Chrysler started devaluing themselves by removing certain things from their portfolios and so on and so forth. So my point is, is that synergy is cold talk for how can we eliminate jobs, eliminate costs, but at the same time, extend ourselves and grow the company. All right. And so what they found out was that they were too top heavy. They couldn't really create the synergy. And often at times when you go into different markets, you find out that the culture is different, the expectations is different, and that you need an entirely different group that understand the culture in order to effectively grow over there in that particular market. All right. It instead announced its plans to divert its resources and focus to double down on wealth management. It's a tactical move that several other major banks have adopted in recent years. I always like to say banking is all about money and guess who's got money? Rich people got money. Everybody wants to bank affluent people. You have a financial advisor usually getting paid on an annual basis of one to two percent of the assets under management. And to that very basic model, you could add fees for margin loans or jumbo mortgages and things like that. But the reason why Wall Street and investors tend to love this business is that it gives off an annuity-like stream of earnings. No matter what's going on in the merger markets, what's going on in trading. It offers high returns. It creates growth opportunities in areas that are in the early stages of wealth generation, like Asia and the Middle East. And it comes with less risk of big mishaps. So I'm going to move up a little bit. This was just over $1.7 trillion. But the company's dominance came to a devastating end in 2008. Shares of the company collapsed from the height of over $500 in 2006 to at one point just under a dollar in 2009. Citigroup was the poster child for what could go wrong in a financial crisis. Leading up to the financial crisis, Citigroup was fairly aggressive in loading up on subprime mortgages and other risky assets that soon became toxic. City and one of the reasons why a lot of these banks was loading up on all of these toxic assets, because a lot of people will say, well, why would they buy into toxic assets that's not necessarily um, or, or that could potentially fail? Well, because they was making a lot of fucking money and a lot of fees that were associated with. Right. So they had these tranches and they had these mortgages and they had these these jumbled together. Uh, financial assets that they then all package with each other in order to sell it over and 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 to get mo enormous fees as a result of it. So everybody was making money until the music stopped. And then Citigroup was one of the one of the banks that was holding all of the mortgages that was trash that then was written down and devalued because nobody could actually pay their mortgage and everybody was losing their homes and then they weren't making money any money because nobody was making any payments anymore. Right. So Citigroup was largely the poster child. Uh, which obviously they recovered, but then they, they haven't adapted and figured out how it is that they can make money 
uh, going forward, 2023 and above, which is one of the reasons that they close and they branches. Uh, and in my ability, they haven't really embraced the technology focused forward and marketed themselves effectively, especially as a player within the mortgage industry that would allow for themselves to continue to be successful. Right. And so just like in 2008, their stock is lagging. Um, they are no longer the biggest bank um, and they're suffering under the leadership of I think her name is Jane. They're suffering under her leadership and they're trying to go through a restructuring. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit more research in order to evaluate whether or not this is a buy opportunity because the value of something is not necessarily based off of what their current stock price is. The value of something is whether or not you see something in this company that would then uh, it's, it's, it's unrealized value that's within the company. Is there any unrealized value that's within Citigroup that we need to be recognizing that we don't see yet that's going to be ex executed on by their current CEO, all right? But they are closing branches worldwide. They are uh, reducing branches here in the United States of America. Uh, they're embracing a digital and mobile first strategy. And so we're going to see how that plays out and whether or not they're able to hold on to their asset sheets um, or their assets that value the company at what it's value at. And we're going to see whether or not it's undervalued based off of their long-term strategy. All right. So I just wanted to leave y'all, leave y'all with that really quickly uh, because we're not all just hundred percent about the fuckery. We do have conversations about money. Actually, everything comes back down to the money, but more importantly, we want to leave y'all with something that's realistic that y'all can do research off of, do your own research. I do not have any shares in city um, that you can do research off of in order to have these conversations.